So today is the final day of the Cold War. We started with talking about World War II, and one of the outcomes of World War II is Soviet Union and U.S. aggression leading towards the Cold War. Uh, we followed that by talking about Korea, and then we talked about the Cuban Missile Crisis. The last class, we talked about Vietnam, and today we're going to talk about the formal collapse of the Soviet Union. We have three daily objectives. Number one, explain why the Soviet Union grew weak before Mikhail Gorbachev took power. Number two, define perestroika, glasnost, and democratization. And three, explain how Ronald Reagan helped topple the Soviet Union. So the first thing that's going to happen, which is going to start a chain of events that leads towards the collapse of the Soviet Union, is the rebellion in Czechoslovakia. Over here on the right, we see a map of Europe. See the light blue is Western Europe. This is France. This is Spain. This is Portugal. We have Great Britain. We have Germany. Remember, Germany is actually split in half right now during this point. We've got Italy, which is kind of falling in line with Western Europe. Austria is technically under the control of the Soviet Union. Yugoslavia is under the control of the Soviet Union. And then we have Czechoslovakia and Poland. Both of those things are part of the Warsaw Pact and under control of the Soviet Union. Czechoslovakia, if you remember a long time ago when we talked about 30 Years' War, is the new name for Bohemia. It's, it's the same place. So the collapse of the Soviet Union starts in Czechoslovakia in 1968. Czechoslovakia, remember, is a member of the Warsaw Pact behind the Iron Curtain, starts loosening controls on censorship. People start saying bad things about communism and the Soviet Union. Soviet Union gets scared. They don't want to lose Czechoslovakia, part of the Iron Curtain, part of the Warsaw Pact, to democracy, because that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid that Czechoslovakia, now that people can say whatever they want, now that they have some sort of freedom of speech, is going to start moving towards democracy. They can't have the middle of Europe going democratic and switching sides, really in the middle of the Cold War, because we're talking 1968. Warsaw Pact countries come together. They invade Czechoslovakia. They end the very short rebellion. They end it. But it plants a seed. The openness in Czechoslovakia had planted a seed that the rest of the Warsaw Pact is going to shortly follow. Second thing that's going to really weaken the Soviet Union is the Soviet-Chinese split. Now remember that the Soviet Union is the very first country in the world to adopt communism. This was formerly Russia, becomes the Soviet Union. Now China becomes a communist country after World War II, after the Chinese Civil War. Now, the Soviet Union is giving economic aid to China and believes that China will kind of do whatever the Soviet Union tells them to because they're a communist country, they're taking aid from the Soviet Union, and therefore they're going to follow the Soviet's lead. China does not, does not want to follow the Soviet's lead. They do not want to become a client state. They, in fact, resent this entire notion, and they begin spreading their own brand of communism to Africa and the rest of Asia. If you remember back when we talked about communism in China, the major difference between communism in China and communism in Europe is that communism in Europe is based on factory workers. It's based on factory workers as a result of the Industrial Revolution and the terrible, terrible, terrible living conditions and working conditions that workers had to face during the Industrial Revolution. In Asia, especially in China, communism is all about peasant farmers. It's got nothing to do with factories. It's got nothing to do with workers got to do with peasant farmers not having land to call their own. This is a totally different form of communism. It's its own brand. That's what works in Asia. Well, that is what worked in Asia. And that is what China wants to spread. Relationship gets worse. The Soviet Union refuses to share nuclear secrets with China. China wants its own bombs. That way it can become a superpower too. The Soviet Union says no. 1959, the Soviet Union officially ends economic aid to China. Shortly thereafter, fighting breaks out along the Chinese-Soviet Union border. See this dark red map right here? That's China. The lighter red map, this is the Soviet Union and the really the Warsaw Pact uh, during the Cold War. This little country right here is Mongolia, which China and the Soviet Union like to fight over. But look at this huge border, really big border between the Soviet Union and China. They're fighting along that border. Just saying, hey, that's my territory. No, that's your territory. Just your average, everyday uh, fighting. 
Now, after repeated incidents, lots and lots of fighting along this really big border, um, they are going to establish some form of peace. But it's a very fragile peace. Fighting breaks out a lot between the two countries. Next, we're going to talk about mutually assured destruction. We talked about mutually assured destruction a few days ago. Basically, it's the idea that if you nuke me, I'll nuke you, and the whole world ends. Mad was kind of mad. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. The Cuban Missile Crisis demonstrated how crazy it, in fact, was. People were terrified. They were absolutely terrified that the world was going to end, and they were all going to die. Um, on top of that, the war in Vietnam had been a disaster for the United States of America. On the flip side, the war in Afghanistan was a disaster for the Soviet Union. The Soviets invaded Afghanistan, which is a country near its borders at the time. Complete disaster, very similar to Vietnam. Widespread popular protests in the USA tore the country apart during Vietnam. The USA slowly starts backing away from this whole idea of mutually assured destruction. They slowly back away of direct confrontation from the, with the Soviet Union. They slowly back away from containment and domino theory because the United States is tired of fighting wars in faraway places. People are tired of seeing their sons die in faraway places for other people. What does the average American citizen care if South Korea is democratic or not? They don't. What they do care about is that their son that died in Korea bring democracy to a South Korean country. They don't care. And this is going to finally blow up in Vietnam. And as a result, people are going to start electing people who get away from these policies. It's just, it's just, not, it's just not sustainable any longer. This leads to the policy known as detente. That's what that fancy D word means, detente. Or basically detente means lessening tensions. We're backing away from all of this overt aggression between the Soviet Union and the United States as well as the United States and communist countries just generally. The, really, the, the, the big proponent of detente was President Richard Nixon over here on the right, and he kind of signals this huge policy shift when he goes to China and meets with Mao Zedong to talk about Chinese-U.S. relations. The first time a U.S. president is meeting with a communist leader, specifically Mao, in order to reestablish positive relations between China and the United States, it works this is what really starts, well, it really begins. The huge import of Chinese goods into the United States of America is going to be the reestablishing of relations between Richard Nixon and Mao Zedong. 1972, the Soviet Union realizes it's in a weak place between, losing, between really weakening relations with China, between losing its grasp on its Eastern European territories. The Soviet Union is going to sign what is called SALT-1, which is an agreement to reduce the amount of nuclear weapons the USA and the Soviet Union are in possession of. SALT-1 is very successful, signed in 1972, and is going to shortly, well, about 10 years in the 80s, it's going to be followed by SALT-2, which for even further reduces the number of nuclear weapons in both countries' stockpiles. The next major hit to the Soviet Union and the next major change in the Cold War is going to be the election of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is a fierce anti-communist. Fierce. Does not like communists. Becomes U.S. president in 1981. After this whole 15 years of detente, Reagan is going to move back away from detente. He's going to say, no, communists are our enemies. I don't like communists. You don't like communists. We don't like communists. We're going to deal with these Soviets, finally. And for the, for the final time, absolutely. Ronald Reagan is going to back the creation of what is called the Strategic Defense Initiative. Its nickname is the Star Wars Program. So kind of, how, kind of like how the Affordable Care Act is called Obamacare. Strategic Defense Initiative was called the Star Wars Program because it was just so futuristic. Now the idea behind the Strategic Defense Initiative, and we'll look at that in a slide, is that basically the United States of America is going to use lasers to block Russian nuclear weapons from hitting the country. It's kind of crazy. Didn't work, but it scared the Soviets, and that's what mattered. So the Soviets are scared of this Ronald Reagan guy. So in 1982, the old Soviet dictator, a guy by the name of Brezhnev, dies, and the Politburo, these are the head communists in the Soviet Union, are going to choose Mikhail Gorbachev to lead the Soviet Union. This is Mikhail Gorbachev over here on the right. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev has some crazy ideas. 
He knows that the Soviet Union is losing the Cold War. The Ronald Reagan, not only has he initiated the Star Wars program, but he's also spent some $2 trillion on military spending. We've got more guns, we've got more ships, we've got more tanks, we've got more bombs, we've got more everything than the Soviet Union does, and the Soviet Union is quickly, quickly, quickly falling behind. So Mikhail Gorbachev takes over, and he's going to institute a series of policy shifts. The first is glasnost. Glasnost means openness. And what glasnost does is the exact same thing that happened in Czechoslovakia back in the 60s. It's going to allow people some freedoms of speech. They can share their ideas. They can share their complaints. The first time in some 70 years, citizens, Soviet Union, are able to criticize their government. Second, Mikhail Gorbachev is going to institute the policy of perestroika. Perestroika is economic restructuring. People are allowed to open their own small businesses. Government-owned factories are allowed to pay people more depending on their performance. People are allowed to sell things. So we have some capitalism slowly drifting its way into the Soviet Union as a result of perestroika. Do we see how the country is slowly, very slowly, very slowly trying to become a little bit more democratic? Final policy is just that, democratization. They form a new legislative body in the Soviet Union and people actually get to vote for the people on that legislative body. Now, the legislative body doesn't have that much power. The power still resides with the Politburo, the top communists. But people are actually allowed to choose their own representatives for a legislative body. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. And again, the Soviet Union is going to fall behind the, US de US, the USA on military spending, especially the Star Wars program which absolutely terrified the Soviets. So this is, this is what the Star Wars program looks like. You've got a ground-based facility that shoots a laser up to a satellite, which reflects the laser, to another satellite, which reflects the laser again, and then the laser hits the Soviet nuclear missile. Kind of cool, kind of crazy, totally didn't work, probably not even possible. That's like a long way for a laser to travel. Uh, but it scared the Soviets, and that was really the whole point. So, Glasnost, Perestroika, democratization are going to have huge consequences on the Soviet Union. Once the door had been opened towards democracy, they couldn't close the door back. It was all or nothing. People in the Soviet Union begin electing leaders that are nationalists. Once again, nationalism rearing its ugly head. What we need to realize about the Soviet Union is the Soviet Union is not just Russia. The Soviet Union is a lot of places. If you look over here on this map, the red line demarcates the Soviet Union from the rest of the world. Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Moldova, Ukraine, Lithuania, all Estonia, Latvia, Belarus, all of these places are part of the Soviet Union, and they all have their own nations in them. Russia is the nation of the Russians. Ukraine is the nation of the Ukrainians. Kazakhstan is the nation of Kazakhs. So people are electing nationalistic leaders, and these nationalistic leaders, A, want political power, because let's be real, the politicians, they want power. So A, they want political power, and two, they want to establish nation states. That's exactly what happens. These leaders defy the Communist Party, they defy the Soviet Union, and they're going to break the Soviet Union up into individual nation states ruled by leaders that represent the people that live in those countries. So all of these policies that Gorbachev, that Gorbachev institutes really collapse and corrode the Communist Party's ability to rule the country. And when this gap shows up, this pocket, the nationalistic leaders take over. And that is how the Soviet Union collapses. Answer your three daily objectives.